Hello and welcome wherever you might be to our complimentary webinar, which is brought to you today in partnership with NICE, AusContact's national gold sponsor, and it's entitled Auckland Council, delivering world-class customer experiences while keeping remote agents productive and engaged. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes and during that time, with the help of today's special guests, we hope to spark your interest and engage you in the conversation, as well as provide some ideas to take back to your respective businesses. To round off the session, we'll be having a Q&A at the end of the webinar and in case you haven't already heard, NICE are giving away a poly headset, but you have to ask a question in the Q&A session. Someone who asks a question will win that poly headset. I'm Fiona Keogh, CEO of OzContact and your moderator for today. I'll also be joined by Cameron Adams, the Director of Solutions Consulting at NICE, who will introduce our guest speaker for today. Cam will also stay online for any questions you might have. So while we're waiting for everyone to join us, let's use the time to run through some housekeeping. Remember to interact with us to maximise the benefit. And as you know, there's no need to take too many, too many notes because we'll be providing you with the recording of the webinar. To interact with us, please use the Q&A button on the control panel. You can ask questions or make comments for Cameron and our special mystery guest today from time to time. Remember, we'll have a full Q&A session at the end of the webinar to win that Polly product. So please type your questions as we go along and stay till the end. If you're listening through headphones or speakers and experience any issues with your internet connection, please note that on the control panel, you can click the raise hand button and the OzContact team will rush to your aid or go back to your confirmation email where the link to the webinar was and all the relevant phone numbers and access codes are available there for you to use. I know that many of you are familiar with asking questions, but let's try the questions pane on the control panel now, just in case you haven't asked a question before. And the question for today is, which country is Australia looking to open a travel bubble with? Maybe we can go and visit our guest speaker today. Oh, and we got some really switched on quick on the keyboard people. Wayne, correct. David, correct. Lena, correct. Susanna, correct. Joe, correct. Louise, correct. Luke, correct. Carol, correct. Um, and the list goes on. And the answer is New Zealand. So let's use those, those um, the Q&A section to make sure that we ask lots and lots of questions. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Cameron Adams, Director of Solutions Consulting at NICE in contact. To kick off today, welcome Cameron. Thank you so much, Fiona. It's really great to be with you all this afternoon. And uh, I was just having a quick look at my calendar from last year, actually. It's almost exactly one year since uh, me and the NICE team travelled over to New Zealand to be uh, with Dave from Auckland Council and the broad council team as we embarked on their agile procurement process for a new cloud contact center solution. Uh, it was an incredible experience to go through that process and it's been a fantastic experience working with the council throughout the last year as we've been working together to deliver a transformational uh, contact center platform. And uh, you know, I really can't believe that it's only just on a year, actually, so much, uh, so much has happened in that time. But I'd love to introduce you to Dave Richards, who is the Manager for Business Excellence at the Council. Uh, a few things you might not necessarily know, uh, Auckland Council is actually the largest territorial authority in Australasia. Uh, they're a very seriously big organisation with more than 300 contact centre agents uh, working remotely, and actually more than that. Uh, in the contact centre in total, something like around 500 contact centre agents in total. A uh, big, uh, complex uh, organisation servicing many, many different contact types. Uh, and uh, 
you know, I'll leave it to Dave to introduce himself and the council a little bit more, but don't forget, please do pipe up with a question through the session uh, and you'll uh, have the chance to, to win a, a fabulous Poly headset. So with that, over to you, Dave, uh, interested to hear about your experience. Great, thanks Cam and uh, welcome everybody. Um, I'll bid you all kia ora from here in New Zealand, which is um, hello and welcome um, in our uh, Indigenous uh, language Māori, Te Reo, te reo Māori. Uh, so today uh, we'll be going through um, this agenda that you can see on the screen here. Um, we'll go through a bit about our story, um, some key highlights from um, our move into a, a cloud-based uh, contact centre platform talk a bit about our, our business objectives and the key learnings that we've had from the migration, uh, the evaluation criteria that we went through when selecting a new tool, um, a bit about the solution that we now have, the benefits of that solution, and then moving towards um, what our new normal looks like uh, with uh, remote-based working. And then we'll end the day with some Q&A uh, as Fiona has uh, talked to. Um, so with that, I will flick on to the next slide. So a bit about Auckland Council um, and our working from home story. Um, so our working from home story uh, actually was established back in uh, 2017. So we uh, went through quite a um, significant uh, consolidation um, of all of our uh, contact centres. Um, those that want to know a bit of history, uh, Auckland Council was originally made up of five uh, different councils, which then got amalgamated in um, 2010. Um, and since then, we, we until 2017, had continued with uh, those, those different contact centres. Uh, in 2017, we did a consolidation, and to avoid, um, I guess, uh, the risk of losing uh, the knowledge and the intel from uh, agents from across the region, we, we stood up the Home Agent Programme. Uh, which was a bit of a first, um, definitely a first for Auckland Council, and I think a, a bit of a first for um, most New Zealand uh, organisations as well, of our size. Um, so since 2017, we've actually had the, the privilege of being able to navigate through um, uh, what being a, a home agent is, um, some of the, the issues and, and, um, and opportunities you have um, being a home agent. Uh, but just this year, um, which I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this, uh, we had uh, the global pandemic, we had COVID-19 um, hit our shores in New Zealand, and we had to move from having about 30% or just under 30% of our agents working from home uh, to 100% um, home agent uh, um, orientated workers. Um, I guess th there's three uh, specific areas that we had to work through to ensure that was a success because obviously moving from 30% to 100% overnight pretty much was, was quite significant. Um, the health, safety and wellbeing of our people was paramount, um, ensuring that our, um, yeah, that our people felt uh, supported um, and, and had everything set up to make them um, make their wellbeing, uh, making sure that was well recognised and looked after was paramount. Um, employee morale, productivity, and team building. Again, that was that was big. We had to really move and transition from agents that were used to being in a room with their their team leaders and their and their colleagues on a day to day basis um, to using um, some of those collaboration tools that are out there now, which I'm sure a lot of you um, use and 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 relate to and and get the support from. Things like Skype and Microsoft Teams um, were were huge in that space. Um, and the third one was technology and, and really um, the technology that allows us um, and the front line to be able to uh, connect with um, our customers. Uh, if we didn't have that uh, stood up and, and available and really well tuned, uh, this wouldn't have worked as well as it actually did. Um, so our view is that we are kind of now in a bit of a new normal. Um, although we are in New Zealand uh, out of lockdown, um, we are um, continuing to, to work in a remote workforce. Um, we've got well over 90% of our agents still working from home. Um, and we're now working through, I guess, the next steps of what um, having that, uh, that future, that new future, that new normal um, is actually going to look like and starting to cement uh, some of that into place. Um, so I'll just go to my next slide. Um, and there should be a poll that comes up on your screen now, uh, which will ask uh, what percentage of your agents are working from home? So that's a, a question out to everyone else in the audience. Thanks, Dave. And Jess has just launched the poll. Um, so the, 
the options are less than 25%, 26 to 50%, 51 to 75, absolutely everybody or is working from home or absolutely everybody is working from the office. Cam, Nice In Contact is a global organisation. Um, so I'm really interested in getting your perspective on what NICE is actually seeing at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, the phenomenon of having to move agents from uh, the office to home is absolutely been a, a global phenomenon. Uh, we've seen uh, not only a need in almost every country that we operate for agents to be able to uh, get themselves home, and in many cases, technology not necessarily enabling them to do that, uh, so needing some help. We've also seen some massive increases in demands on scale as volumes have fluctuated wildly. And so, you know, for example, in, in New York State, uh, we helped uh, expand uh, by something like 800% their agent population. Uh, and the New York State is hosting around 40,000 agents working from home uh, on, on the CX1 platform. So, uh, yeah, just a very, very tumultuous time. Um, yeah. It absolutely is. And I think, you know, as each wave um, occurs, and unfortunately, that is, seems to be the way forward, that that percentage is probably going to move backwards and forwards as we flex the workforce in and out of um, CBDs or their, their workplaces. So, Jess, if you could close the poll. While Jess is closing the poll, we've got lots of questions coming in already. So, it looks like we've got lots of people hanging around till the end of the webinar because that poly headsets seem to be very popular. So, wow, we are 100%. Everybody is working from home is the biggest the result, 44%. That's, that's a bit, that's, maybe we've got lots of people from Victoria on today, I don't know. Um, uh, less than 25% is 7%, 26 to 50, 13%, 51 to 75, 29, and everybody's back in the office is 7%. Maybe that's our Queenslanders and now our WA people and SA people, I don't know. Interesting. Dave, back to you. Great, thanks Fiona. So I'll now just go through some of the um, key highlights around thriving and what is, as I say, our new normal. Um, and one of those uh, is definitely, as I said, making sure that we've got the right technology um, to enable uh, really seamless interactions with our customers. And having a cloud-based platform uh, that enables scalability, so the, big, the ability to go uh, bigger and smaller as required. Um, flexibility and unification and and when I think of unification I think of that that kind of unified channel approach whereby uh, you can have agents working on multiple channels uh, concurrently all in the one solution which is a big a big win for us um, implementing a cloud-based platform um, brings all frontline teams into the one services platform uh, that means that we can have visibility um, reporting, workforce management, um, a whole raft, uh, range of different things all available in the one platform uh, for our agents to use collectively. Um, it provides great capability and integration. So, you know, some of the capability that a cloud-based platform provides over some of the more traditional platforms um, is uh, some of the things I can that come to mind for me are things like interaction analytics and re having really real-time uh, visibility of what your customers are talking about as you're on the call and, and integration as well. Um, and we've been looking at um, kind of some, some thinking around uh, how we might integrate with our CRM um, and other enterprise systems down the track. Um, it empowers an agent experience, uh, greater agent experience, greater productivity and engagement. And I'll go through some of that shortly. Um, the new system will improve the customer experience and visibility of the customer journey. And we'll, I'll give you a, a quick sneak peek at what, our, what we call our agent desktop, uh, which really gives you visibility of that, that customer um, and how they've, how they've dealt with council and how we've managed them in the past, and also future proofs uh, for automation and AI, uh, which I'm looking forward to, and I know many of my colleagues are too. So some of our business objectives, um, we really categorize them under three headings, agent, customer, and the technology enablers. From an agent perspective, as I've said, it, it really does improve uh, productivity, uh, performance and employee engagement. And you know, having a, having a cloud-based platform that allows us to work from home 
um, we know has really helped us increase all three of those areas um, through pretty much every productivity measure. And you know, as you know, those of you that are managing contact centers, there are a lot of them. Um, productivity is up um, in comparison to those uh, for, to when we were fully in the office. Um, future integration with CRM and other enterprise systems, as I mentioned, that's going to really enable us to have that full um, holistic view of the customer and and uh, and how different parts of council are dealing with that council, that customer, and some of that innovation as well um, that really helps us um, ensure that um, we're set up to meet uh, future council behaviours and values. So as the organisation change, changes, as council changes. We, we needed to make sure we had a, a system, a customer facing system that changes with it as well. Um, from a customer experience perspective, um, we wanna make sure that the, the interactions uh, are more seamless, um, that business continuity is really there and cloud-based platforms definitely help with that um, to ensure that there is pretty much every um, uh, style of outage or, or performance issue, there is some kind of redundancy behind it. And, and really make sure that we are set up for self-service solutions. Things like chatbots and, and AI-based um, conversational IVR, uh, which we're looking at a product called Google Dialogflow uh, to help us with that. Um, and I've kind of already mentioned, but the technology enablers were, were big pieces for us as well. Being able to be scale, scalable, agile, um, have a, a cost-effective um, system, because obviously any cost uh, that our systems cost us, we have to pass on to our, our ratepayers and just ensuring that it's future proof. So hopefully we don't have to go through a, a procurement um, process any sooner than we need to. So now we have another poll. We're making them work, Dave, aren't we? So what are your team's contact centre objectives? So you can pick more than one, because like Dave, he had many, many objectives nicely grouped under three categories. Is it improve employee engagement, productivity and performance, future integration with CRM and other enterprise systems, unified contact centre solution that is future proofed, more seamless customer experience, self-service solutions, for example, chatbots and AI based conversational IVR, or something else. And if you've got something else, then you just type that into the Q&A panel. Um, Cam. Mm. What are you guys saying? Well, it's really interesting. I think there's a, a, a real kind of groundswell in the recent kind of like maybe last year or two of organizations trying to change the way that they're able to engage with their customers to better reflect how we interact with each other. So that, that kind of digital experience that we have when we communicate with each other, we might WhatsApp and the going gets a bit tough and we'll pick up the phone and carry on the conversation is something we do intuitively with each other. And I'm seeing a lot of organizations trying to uh, be able to create that seamless digital experience. But at the same time, they're also trying to drive down their costs. And uh, you know, a lot of the focus around that is how can we make self-service more intelligent? So there's a, a lot of focus on uh, chatbots and automation uh, in the in the interaction with customers, but equally automation in the back end of that interaction. So how do we actually automatically get an order fulfilled so that we can kind of drive down our costs? Those are two kind of really major themes that, that uh, we're having conversations about at the moment. Fabulous. Well, Jess, if you could close the poll uh, and let's see what everyone's focusing on. Okay, number one. I don't think there's a surprise there. A more seamless customer experience, 82% of the attendees. Um, followed, maybe not so close, closely, at 69% by uh, improved employee engagement, productivity and performance. Uh, and then self-service solutions, et cetera. Um, interesting. Interesting. Um, so we've got lots of things that people are working on concurrently, which just adds to the complexity uh, of what we're aiming to deliver, but clearly um, with the customer at the heart of everything that we do. Dave, back to you. Great, thank you, Fiona. Very interesting results. Um, so I'm just now gonna go through a few of our key learnings that we've had uh, when uh, moving uh, towards a cloud-based platform. 
Um, and the first one, uh, and this has been quite honest around our journey in particular, um, is really having reliance on an aggressive roadmap. And um, as we know, you know, cloud-based platforms, cloud-based um, contact center platforms haven't been around, um, you know, for a, for a long, long time. And so they are all, as you know, as they are catching up and as they are um, moving into the, you know, into what um, requirements organizations are needing now, you really are um, relying on ensuring that things are, are there and available um, to be used to meet your business requirements. Um, you know, we had a real key learning around making sure that we can walk properly before we can run and, and making sure things like um, skills-based routing, um, your, your quality program, your, your proper workforce management are really in there and embedded well before you move into some of the more um, fancy things uh, such as what Cam was talking about with the, the conversational IVR and the chatbots. Um, they all sound really good and, they, and they're really fancy and they give um, your customer a really good experience. But if you make sure you've got the, you know, the, the, the ground, groundwork done first, it really does help out in the long run. Um, stakeholder buy-in is a big thing and, and we've had a, a very significant uh, change management um, approach and, and, and uh, program happening across council probably over the last six months in order to make sure that our agents, our leaders, um, and all the way up there, as it says to our executive, um, have bought into this. And um, we've found that having executive sponsorship and prioritization really has made a difference. And in comparison to other uh, programs of this type that I've run without executive sponsorship, we've actually been able to get a lot of things done in a, in a small time frame and, um, and done to a really high quality standard as well because of having all of those people involved and having that executive sponsorship um, done too. Um, ensuring frontline expectations are set from the start and we had a subset of our, um, our frontline actually involved in the agile procurement process that uh, Cam talked about right at the start. Um, they are involved right from then so they knew what was going to be coming uh, with the new platform. They knew what it was going to set us up to be able to do and what it was going to set us up not to be able to do. Um, and really making sure that through that change management program that those expectations are well set. Um, and you're having showcases with your people, um, I, we've found as being uh, paramount to success. And, and again, um, you know, as we have moved to a, from a 30% uh, remote environment to a 100% remote environment, um, we've really had to revisit that change management approach and understand um, what you can do to make, make it work still in a remote environment. Um, setting up things such as competitions and, um, and daily briefing sessions and, and like I said, showcases um, are, are really fundamental, I think, in, in order to get people tuned in. Um, and, you know, that's quite different to what you might do in, a, in an office setting or in a traditional contact center setting, um, as we've seen in the past. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about the evaluation criteria um, that we had uh, going through our Agile procurement process. And for those that don't know what an Agile procurement process is, at the highest level possible, it, it, it allows you to actually, as, it's, as it probably sounds, move at pace. Um, and as opposed to having, you know, multiple hundred page um, uh, RFS or RFI, um, uh, sorry, RFP documentation, um, it really lets you um, get all the right players in the room at the same time um, to be able to work through what uh, your requirements are and really um, understand with having the, the vendors in front of you how, how you're going to be able to meet those requirements and have, them de have it demonstrated to you. Um, so the four things we looked at was the, the current and future requirements alignment. So we um, had quite a significant requirements process where we talked to um, all of our users, our frontline, our team leaders, our quality teams, our workforce management team, our reporting team, everybody across the board and understood the requirements both now and also uh, what they may be in the future. And we spent a fair bit of time um, investigating where the market was going, where the industry was going uh, in, the, in the customer interaction space. Um, architectural fit was important. We wanted to, we have a cloud first strategy at council. We really wanted to make sure that um, whatever we were procuring was going to fit in um, with the remainder of our architecture and we were going to be able to integrate without too many issues um, and, and so on. 
uh, values alignment. So we really looked at the, the values and the behaviors and the, the culture um, between the vendor that we chose and, and the vendors that we had on the table and, and the values that we have within uh, council to, to ensure that there was alignment and that we were gonna be able to work together uh, well, both through the procurement process, uh, the implementation process, and then into um, support and, and an ongoing partnership as well. And last but not least, obviously price was in there as well. Um, and yeah, we had to make sure that um, the total cost of ownership uh, model was gonna be able to uh, be met. And, and um, yeah, we worked through that to quite some detail. So a bit about the solution. Um, so we've now implemented or in the process of implementing and rolling out um, a, a leading CloudPlace um, customer experience platform. And you can see there, there's a raft of um, modules as we call them. Um, we had our automated uh, contact distributor, which allows for distribution and routing of calls, chat, um, chat messages and emails um, across our, our um, team of agents. An agent desktop, which allows us to as I mentioned before, have full visibility of the customer interactions and the customer experience, both in the in the current interaction and in past interactions. Um, inter, uh, analytics, both from an interaction analytics as well as from a reporting perspective, we have to make sure that we, we really have our, our finger on the dial around um, what customers are saying and, and when they're saying it. Uh, an integrated workforce management system. Uh, so really looking at that forecasting and scheduling and the real-time management of, of your agents. Uh, quality management, so being able to evaluate and analyze the, the quality of the interactions that we have. Um, feedback management, that's the, the real-time customer satisfaction um, uh, surveys and, and reporting. And we found that, um, and, we're, and we're going through the process of, uh, of implementing that at the moment, and we're really um, liking the look of um, what's able to come out the back of that. And um, one thing I'll say is, is make, ensuring that it's real time, um, I think is fundamental um, for ensuring that it's gonna be successful and really lead to some, um, some improvements uh, that you can implement as well. Uh, Google Dialogflow integration, uh, that, that enables our, <coughs> excuse me, our ability to um, uh, set up some of those AI systems. So things like uh, the conversational IVR and the chatbot, that Google Dialogflow enables that uh, to be done all in a, in a centralized manner using um, a lot of the complex and, and um, uh, future focused, I guess, algorithms uh, that Google have been working on for quite some time. And performance management, um, last but not least, is the, is the module that allows us to um, have a real integrated um, understanding of our agents and their performance, um, their coaching plans, and also gamification around how um, our agents are doing against the, the stats that we're wanting to measure. So that's the solution. It's a, it's a mouthful, I know, and um, there's a lot to it, but it, it definitely um, all helps in ensuring a, a better customer experience. So I said I'd, I'd give you a, a quick snapshot of what our agent desktop looks like, and I, I'm um, quite proud of this. Um, we worked on this with um, Cam and the team early on, um, and this really shows, um, as I've talked about, a full visibility of, of the customer. Um, you can see here our, our contact card, which gives visibility of the, the customer's details, the contact list, so if somebody else from that same phone number or email address is, is called before, we'll have their details. Um, the interaction notes, so that gives us visibility of, um, or sorry, the, the agent, the ability to type and, and enter in notes about the, the, the particular interaction. And then this here, this little beauty is the, the interaction history, which gives um, visibility of going back, you know, could be years um, once we've had the, the platform in for some time. Um, and you can see here, we've got an interaction search um, that gives the ability to um, search those interactions um, across all channels. So whether it come in through a, um, a phone call, an email, a chat, or, or even in one of our face-to-face -face service centers that, are, that will all be visible there in the one desktop. And that's popping, as you can see here, at the same time as the, uh, the phone call that somebody has made into council. Over to you, Fiona. Thanks, Dave. And Jess, if you could launch the poll. Again, we're making you work. Which technology investments are of priority in the next six to 12 months? And you can pick 
all of the above. So you're going to have to click four times. Um, so is it AI, analytics and automation? Is it a cloud contact center? Is it workforce optimization? Is it chatbots and conversational AI? Cam, what's the global story? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I guess the, the most uh, arresting global story on this one is the, the move to cloud. I think um, what we've seen across the entire globe is that organizations have, have started to recognize that you know, the old patchwork of, of on-premise bits and pieces integrated together uh, is, is not something that's been working for them in terms of their pace of innovation. And so they're looking now to, to cloud platforms, really, first and foremost, to be able to increase that pace of innovation. So they don't have to integrate lots of pieces together anymore. They can just go and get a solution that offers a broad range of capabilities that is updated all the time. Uh, and they can really focus on delivering improvements to their customer experience at a much greater rate, um, you know, supported by intelligence, uh, AI and automation and so on. Right, Jess, could you close the poll and let's find out. Wow, that's pretty flat, but workforce optimization number one. It's probably a little bit of a surprise, um, I guess, but... Um, then we have um, cloud, the Cloud Contact Center. I guess there's no surprises there given uh, the current circumstances. Uh, and AI, analytics and automation and chats, chatbots and conversational AI at 49%. So um, a pretty interesting result, methinks. Um, but interesting to see where people are focusing. So Dave, it's back to you. Great, thank you to my next slide. So I think uh, one of the last sections I'm going to go through is just some of the benefits um, that we have, uh, we envisaged and set out to try and achieve uh, moving to a, a cloud-based platform. Um, the first one for us was really uh, risk mitigation. So um, I guess what made us move um, as quick as we have um, wasn't knowing that COVID was coming because unfortunately the crystal ball that we had didn't quite show that. Um, but it, but really having that unsupported platform in place that we knew we had to um, migrate off and, and get to something new really set that boundary and, and that's one benefit I can definitely tell you we've put the tick on. Um, the next one there is around increased productivity. So ensuring that we have um, um, the right uh, processes and, and technology enablers in place to be able to make the agent experience as productive as possible has been key to success of, of this platform and was and is definitely a benefit that we set out for. And although we didn't put any, any financial measures or anything around it at the start, we can definitely already start to see um, some of that productivity coming through. Um, and that's, I, I think, through, uh, or I know through uh, some of the visibility that we have uh, through that agent desktop that I've just shown you in the last couple of slides, um, as, as well as just having, um, I guess, everything all in one unified platform. You know, an agent doesn't have to go here for their quality and here for their, for their schedule and over here for something else. It's all just unified together. And I can't understate um, how much, how helpful that is. Um, I found it interesting, as you did, Fiona, around the, the workforce optimization um, being uh, on top there in that poll. And I, and I guess for us, that's really important too. And our key measure for that is um, increased scheduling efficiency. And, and we wanted to make sure that, um, you know, our schedule, how we scheduled our resources um, in the workforce management or workforce optimization module um, was, was done a whole lot better than what we'd done before, ensuring that the, the ACD um, and the workforce management modules were um, talking to each other well, um, and, and ensuring that what we'd set out and, and forecast, uh, forecasted in terms of um, uh, volumes and handling times and, and um, shrinkage levels, how many people are going to be away, etc. were able to be recognised when we looked at the schedule. So that's that was scheduling efficiency. And, and last but not least is, is the increased customer satisfaction. And I guess I put that at the bottom because it isn't the least, uh, but because all of the things above um, really do lead to um, increased customer satisfaction. Um, across all channels, I believe, and uh, that that was a key benefit we set out for um, improving. 
and if our agents if our front line have the technology available to them to be able to uh, serve a customer well the the payback is going to um, is going to come through in your customer satisfaction uh, results as well So the new normal, what does um, empowering an agile and remote workforce look like for us in our new normal? Um, so being able to empower um, your and, and our remote workforce to do their best work from anywhere um, we think is key. Um, that's key within um, the COVID-19 times, but also key, you know, to be able to work around everybody, uh, you know, all our agents um, work-life balance as well. Um, and letting them do what they need to from where, wherever they are is, is, a, is paramount. Um, delivering outstanding customer experiences uh, remotely without impacting productivity, security, and compliance and engagement. And hopefully through um, today's session, you've been able to pick up some of the areas where we've been able to do that um, and, and do it all remotely, which has uh, led to benefits as well. I've been able to motivate and engage, and um, I talked a little bit about the performance management module uh, that we're just working our way through now, um, and, and that's part of it, and, and being able to have good coaching. Um, but yeah, really making sure that you've got those um, collaboration tools surrounding your agents to be able to ensure that they still feel motivated and engaged in the work in which they're doing. Um, integrating and improving communication, and, and by that I definitely don't mean bombard them with more emails around what's happening in their world and, and what they need to know about, but really making sure uh, that it's integrated, it's all in one place, and, and that it is, um, you know, um, targeted as well. And I, I was talking to um, one of our agents the other day who had been away on, on leave for quite some time, and she came back saying that she'd read um, 600 emails and out of that 600 emails, she had a, only an A4 page uh, worth of points that she actually had to do something with. And so, and you know, that really uh, painted a picture to me as to, you know, how much we do over communicate in times and how much improvement there is we can do in that space. Definitely as we're working remotely now. And, and finally, being able to prepare for the future um, with a scalable, flexible and unified cloud solution. And um, yeah, uh, I, that's definitely an enabler. You need to have all your processes and your policies and your um, your, your standard operating procedures set, set up well. But if you've got that that unified solution under underpinning all of that, you're definitely going to be on for a winner. In my in my words, and I'm pretty sure that's my last slide. Okay, so we're up to Q and A, and my goodness. The attendees today have been on those keyboards. We've got 35 questions. Now we're not going to get to 35 questions, but if you want to be in the running for that poly headset, you've got to stay on to the end, even if we don't ask your question. But the first question that we do have is for you, Dave. Um, and Gavin would like to know, how did you frame or secure the funding how did you manage your business case? How did it get approved? And so it's a double bunger question. How have you staged or have you staged the implementation? Sure. So um, we have a, a fairly standard uh, business casing process um, and within council that we all have to follow. And, and I'm sure like many other um, large organisations, um, it has to go through the, the regular um, approval cycles and review cycles to get to a, a final outcome. And yeah, I can't say that was easy, but it's it's not easy for a reason. And that's to ensure that you've done all your, all your homework. Um, you've looked at all the right um, cost benefit analysis um, that you've planned in all your risks and your, and your schedules got as much as it can and that to uh, ensure that there's, there's nothing missing. So it really was an iterative process. It, de it definitely involved a lot of people because it, you know, it is seen as a as a fundamental um, enabler for for, for council and our customers. Um, but yeah, it, it's it, yeah, it really just was a I, I guess a, a fairly standard uh, business casing process. Can you just remind me the second part of that question, Fiona? Sorry. Yep, not a problem. So, did you stage the implementation? Sure, yeah. So each of those modules that I went through um, have been staged and, and kind of based on priority 
uh, to a number of different stakeholders. So we started off with um, the, the ACD, that, that automated content uh, contact distributor, um, and then worked our way back from there. Um, and so, and not only, you know, within the, um, not only did we stage or, um, yeah, stage the modules, we also, um, iteratively delivered uh, to different parts of council and we decided to start with uh, one of our internal help desks. So we started with one of our internal help desks to make sure that we got used to the platform, um, that we understood how it was going to work. We nailed any issues, not that there were many, um, before we were to roll it out to somebody, um, out to a customer facing um, uh, team. And that's been, been really good for being able to learn things before we uh, let it live on some of our larger contact centres. Thank you. We're going to talk a little bit about well-being um, because that's a hot topic at the moment as well. And Michael uh, would like to know, he's finding with his crew working from home that some of them are struggling with challenging callers in the absence of colleagues being close by to blow off some steam after the call. How are you supporting your staff after those challenging calls? Yeah, so um, we've definitely taken full advantage of um, Microsoft Teams and that, that definitely is a, a go-to place um, and I have full visibility of that, um, mostly from a technology support perspective, but I can tell you in there we have a, um, a staff welfare, if you like, or an engagement section where people can, um, our agents can go in to talk about uh, challenging calls and, and so on. Um, we've also got our leadership function, obviously, and, and we've got leaders and, um, and, and a support team uh, that people can go to if they need to talk about a, a caller or a call or, or something that's not working for them. Um, and I, I guess finally, we have um, quite a large um, focus on collaboration groups across, um, across our customer services department, and we've ensured that we've continued those um, those collaboration groups, which talk about a, a range of topics as we've gone remote and, and again used uh, Microsoft Teams for um, ensuring that we have that, um, that two-way conversation throughout the week. Thank you. Cam, this might be one for you. Um, Dylan would like to know, what would the plan be if the technology that supports remote working fails and all staff are taken offline? Wow, that's a that's a tough question. I suppose uh, you know the the first thing is uh, it's important to have technology that's very very unlikely to go offline. Uh, so you know having uh, a, a, a kind of really solid plan for resiliency um, in the platforms that you're using is is crucial. But if we assume, for example, that you know, all of that comes unstuck. Uh, then it becomes about having a, a few fallback options. It's about, you know, potentially being able to just simply direct phone calls out over the public telephone network um, to, uh, you know, a simple hunt group. Uh, it's about potentially having some fallback self-service options. Uh, if the platform is still okay, but you've lost your connectivity to all of your agents. So, you know, it, it's something that requires thought and planning, but um, I think probably the main thing is uh, try and make sure that your technology is resilient as possible so you're not in that position in the first place. Thank you. Dave, there's a, a question for you here. Again, um, more about wellbeing, et cetera, and it's from David. Um, he's asking, has there been any difference in morale, et cetera, between a home agent during lockdown and a home agent without lockdown? Yes, very good question, David. Um, and it, it's definitely something that I've been interested in um, from a, a reporting and a, and a data analysis perspective as well. Um, and so we've um, just, uh, actually I can't say they just last little while because we've been doing it for quite some time now. We've had um, health checks uh, with our people and that's not, obviously going to the doctor type of health check, but just a check in uh, with, a, with a survey that our agents um, undertake, I think every second week to see how they're doing. Um, and we've also started doing um, engagement surveys as well to be able to see uh, how we're going engagement wise in comparison to where, how we were um, pre-lockdown uh, pre and pre-having everybody working from home. Um, and I can tell you there definitely hasn't been an impact. I think 
um, you know, with all the collaboration tools, as I keep talking about being around, um, having a, you know, a cloud-based platform that uh, people can use, which means that, you know, there's less outages and, and less performance issues. Um, we definitely uh, are in a better position engagement wise. Um, I can tell you since 2017 as well, um, when we've had our annual engagement surveys, um, our, out of the, I think we had three, no, four um, home agent teams and, and another um, eight within the, within the physical contact centre, the, the four, three or four um, home agent based teams have always had the, some of the highest engagement scores um, of the entire contact centre. So yeah, I, I think it just becomes a new normal as, as it said in the slides, it definitely people do get used to it and um, people really start to feel engaged, not through having to see people face to face, but being able to talk to a, probably a wider group of people um, through some of those uh, collaboration forums um, that are available. So cool. yeah. So one for both of you, but Dave, we might get you to kick off first. Um, this is from Luke. Luke would like to know how you see self-automation, self-service solutions such as AI and chatbots assisting or replacing agents. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, uh, something you need to think long and hard about, to be honest. I don't think it's a, a, a thing that anybody can rush into overnight. And, and the, the reason for that is um, it only takes one bad experience with a self-service um, agent for people to lose trust in them. And um, we've done just a small proof of concept and, and had some, some very minor um, customer testing through that um, to be able to see how that works. And I think, you know, um, for the amount of time it's going to take to, to train a, an AI based agent um, to get to the same level as um, how much time we spend uh, training a, um, a human agent, um, the, the payback's not quite there. And, and I guess it's going to take, yeah, like I said, some time um, to be able to, to, to really make that happen and, and work well. But um, we're, we're, what I think is you start with the basic interactions. You start with um, yeah, the things that don't require integration. You start with the things that don't require a, a complex logic flow to get to an outcome. And, you know, for, for us in a council, things like uh, we get phone calls from people that ask simple things like, what time is my library open? That's a, that's a key thing that I think a bot can answer without too much, um, you know, without too much complexity in comparison to um, what's my rates balance or where can I build my house? Um, that's probably not something right now that you'd want to spend time um, putting into a bot agent. Those are my thoughts. What do you think, Cam? Yeah, oh, look, I, I totally agree, Dave. And I think, you know, the, the crucial thing is that uh, the human agents are not going away anytime soon. Uh, you know, the, mm. to me, the most important thing about what you've described is how do you ensure that there is just as little as friction as possible between interacting with a bot and interacting with a person so that, you know, when a customer calls in with perhaps a simple inquiry and then needs to continue on with something a bit more complicated, you know, that they can get that help from the agent, not have to reintroduce themselves, really have, uh, as we all said, was quite important up top, a seamless experience. So I think AI is, it's going to automate, you know, it's going to help automation. It's going to augment agents. It will assist agents. It will supercharge self-service, but uh, it will be something that is deployed absolutely collaboratively and in connection with agents to create a, a seamless experience into it, in my view. Thank you. Now for a change of pace, Joe would like to know, how would you rec recommend strategizing moving from a predominantly Excel-based manual forecasting and rostering system, oh girl, I feel your pain, in an organization um, that may only focus on cost rather than gains and in brackets, due to manual processes and lack of data, it is hard to show financial gains in productivity, et cetera, as there is no real baseline to compare against. Mm. I'll start and I'm sure um, Cameron will have something to say as well <laughs> but yeah I 100% I feel your pain um, doing workforce management through spreadsheets um, my, my team of workforce management people um, have done the same thing for a number of years even before I came along um, I guess all I can really say is you know having it in one having it in your core um, unified communication or, or customer interaction platform 
um, means that you don't have to do that manual work. Like it just, it takes away the the, the manual computation of um, what your forecast is and, and what your schedule is going to look like to meet that forecast. Um, and really means you can spend your time um, doing that value add work and providing, you know, hypothetical, um, um, I think they call it um, what if scenarios. And and those what if scenarios, we've just started toying with them now, um, are, are huge. And if you can do them on the basis of real data and, and you know, what's actually um, happening right now, um, I think that's, that's a really big one. And... Um, my hypothesis is that we'll move away from doing, you know, 18 month or five year forecasts as, as I think contact centers have done in the past and be a bit more real time around how we plan. And, you know, there are still going to be things from the, you know, from, you know, a, a year ago that'll be the same now, but I think the the changes are a lot more um, in the moment. And as we work through, th through things like COVID-19 with lockdowns, um, I, I think that's been evident um, in my experience anyway. Okay, here's a, trust, a question probably for you, Cam, but I'm sure, Dave, you can, you can chime in. Katie would like to know, is the agent desktop part of the NICE platform or is this something you built yourself to integrate with NICE? Right, great, great question. So uh, it's, it's actually neither. Uh, so it's a, it's a great example actually of a pre-integrated solution offered by one of the more than 150 developer partners who are part of the, the Nice in Contact Dev1 program. So uh, under the hood, that, that agent desktop contact card interaction history capability um, that, that was uh, you know, customized with quite sophisticated requirements from the council comes from one of our partners called Spice CSM. Uh, and, and it's a great, great platform. Uh, and you know, as, as you can see, uh, provides a, a really great holistic view to agents uh, on, on customers. Fantastic. Dave, did you want to add anything? Oh, I think that about covers it. Yeah, well. Brilliant. Okay, so tennille has got um, probably a political question for you, Dave. Um, did you struggle to get senior leadership buy-in or endorsement? And were you able to get them on board to lead by example. Yeah, um, I think what I can say is that different executives have different focuses, right? And if you're, if you've got a executive team member or or a set of them who are focused on the customer, um, getting something like this across the line will not be difficult. Um, and I guess what I've learned through my time in council and, and probably wider in my career is that making sure that um, the executive are dialed into, um, I guess, the experiences that the customer are having um, is key to success and in, in getting a business case of this nature across the line. Um, as soon as they can hear calls, understand the frustrations and the, the pain that an agent has to go through in order to undertake a, a call or an email or whatever type of interaction it is, the easier, or maybe not easier, but yeah, the, the more direct the conversation will be when it comes to getting a, a business case of this nature or, or anything else in the future across the line. And um, we, we've had our, our chief executive and, and some of our directors come through our contact centre just in the last uh, few weeks and listen to um, some calls and, and be on um, the phone with, with some of our agents, be able to see, you know, what, what works and, and what doesn't work so well. And I think that really helps when you're going as a, as a manager to present that business case that they've had that, that first-hand experience. Thank you. We've got quite a few people asking about your evaluation criteria when you were selecting your solution. What sorts of criteria did you use? Did you weight different criteria? Um, how, how did you actually go about it? I can't quite remember the, the weightings, but we definitely had weightings. Um, we, yeah, we, the four that I went through on screen earlier um, around requirements fit, architectural fit, uh, values fit and price. They were the four things that we, we looked at. And I, I think you can, you look at them all um, not in isolation of each other. And sometimes 
um, in order to get a, a really good functional fit, you've got to take a little bit of a, an architectural fit or potentially a price fit um, hit to be able to make that work. And so we were forever, I guess, having conversations in, in our agile procurement process around, you know, to do this, the impact on, on something else was going was gonna to be, you know, something else. And I think, you know, as long as you've got those right people in there having those conversations and figuring out what's going to be best for, for everybody, you know, internal stakeholders, customers, um, uh, agents, et cetera, um, the easier that's going to be. And, and that's one of the real wins I found um, having an agile procurement process was everybody was together having those conversations as opposed to it being, I guess, in some more traditional RFP situations, having people um, sit in their, in their dark office trying to figure out just their part of the procurement. So, yeah, that was really good. Made it really okay. collaborative. We've still got 35 questions. We could be here all day and they keep coming. So this is, this is amazingly fabulous. Um, so I'm kind of lumping the gamification question all together with what sorts of elements are you using? Are people more engaged? Are you gamifying behaviours or just KPI? KPIs, how are, you, how are you using gamification? I'm going to let Cam answer that. We're, we're still quite immature in our gamification journey, but I know Cam's done, had a fair bit of experience of other, other organisations. Yeah, cool. Um, thanks, Dave. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, Dave and, and I were just talking about this last week uh, in terms of what we might uh, look to do with gamification. So it's sort of early days in, in that journey there. But, um, you know, uh, we think that uh, gamifying uh, underlying behaviours and also, you know, ensuring that the gamification, uh, the, the design of the games really creates a balanced kind of set of behaviours. Um, you know, this is something that's really, really important in uh, the way that, that games are designed to make sure that we consider that, that we're not creating lopsided behaviours uh, and that there aren't any unforeseen com consequences, I suppose, uh, of, of that gamification. Um, what's also interesting is, um, you know, in terms of what to give as rewards. So one of the things that we've observed globally is that, you know, it's not necessarily so motivational to give just, you know, points for widgets off a gadget store. Um, in many cases, uh, giving people you know, some of the perks or privileges that an organization can offer that don't even necessarily cost money. Like one of our US customers, uh, you know, effectively auctions off in the gamification module, uh, undercover parking spots in their uh, extremely baking hot um, car park in Arizona every week. Um, and, you know, many organizations do things like early time off or late starts. Um, those sorts of things can be quite a lot more appealing than necessarily, you know, just uh, battery powered fans or new headphones or something like that. Um, so hopefully that gives a couple of ideas. We've actually got lots of thinking around this that we'd be happy to share in a separate session if you're ever interested. Fantastic. Um, Dave, Tanil would like to know, do you think the customer has noticed any difference to the workforce being home based? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Has the customer noticed? I think they've probably noticed, for some of our more frequent customers, may have noticed the, uh, how do I put this, the accountability or the, um, the authorization, I guess, that an agent now feels um, sitting at home without having somebody to turn around and talk to behind them. Um, and some of the questions and, and support uh, areas that we were getting when people were sitting in the in the physical center are now gone um, and, and it's not because we've given them more information or more knowledge or more processes it's just that they don't have that that flexibility of just putting an agent on hold and turning around so they're actually taking the time to, to understand the answer to the customer's question and really um, uh, ensure and, and feeling like they can actually answer it um, without having to get um, qualification from somebody else whether it be their leader or a, or a support worker worker within the team um, so yeah I, I think the, the the impact would have been positive if, if anything and, and our customer satisfaction results are showing that so far that's great so we've got 
Only a couple of minutes to go, so maybe um, we'll ask one more question before we get some closing comments from both of you, if you don't mind. Peter would like to know, is the nice solution you've implemented fully live? Is it fully live? Yes, it is fully live in some of our teams. Um, we're actually still uh, working through the implementation in, in other teams and for other modules. Um, yeah, we're, we're only just around the corner actually for having our, our big contact centre li um, live, which is only a few days away now. We're just working through the, the final training and, and, and so on for that. Um, so yes, it, it is fully live in a certain part of the business, but we are still on that journey uh, for full implementation. But by the end of this year, we'll be um, yeah, we will be fully live across across our different customer facing teams. Wonderful. Well, we're at the hour. Any closing comments, gentlemen? I'd just like to thank you, Dave. I really appreciate you spending the time uh, this afternoon to share your experiences. Uh, you know, it's great working with you in the council, and um, you know, look forward to. Uh, continuing on some aspects of those, the, the journey that we're, we're working on together. Yeah, no, it goes both ways, Cam. And I'd just like to say thanks also to everybody for your insightful questions. It's, um, it makes me think as well um, around some of the areas uh, that we are doing uh, with some of those questions. So thank you and all the best. Right, well, we've still got 32 unasked questions, but don't worry, um, as long as you're not anonymous, those questions will be answered uh, after the webinar. And of course, if you've stayed on till the end, you're still in the running for the Poly Voyager uh, headset. So with that, I would love to thank Dave for his insights and his generosity uh, in sharing the Auckland Council story with us today. And to uh, Cameron and the team at NICE, uh, thank you for your continued support as our national gold sponsor. And to everybody that's joined us today, have a wonderful rest of your day, wherever you might be. See you soon. <laughs>